patient. Yes, I think let's just, let me find yeah. out. Now, um, I won't say anything more about Sebastian because he'll introduce himself. If you're interested in, in what the, the work that their group doing, take a look at the link to their to him and also at least to his his uh, his page, I guess. I'm not, I hope I got the right page, Sebastian. And you can look also at the recent papers that they publish in this area. Um, I met Sebastian um, because of, uh, I can't remember now, because of our interest in machine learning control, and he was suggested particularly by Manfred Marari. And um, so I'm glad to hear about this the cool. I, we had, a, we had a, a visit, a virtual visit to his lab, and I thought the work that we're doing was just fit right into what we wanted to do. So Sebastian, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot, Toby. Um, thanks a lot for, for having me. Um, and I'm um, very happy to, uh, to present at your, at your workshop. So my, my talk is, is, is uh, um, titled Lessons from Using Machine Learning for Control. So um, the, for a number of years now, we've been working at this intersection of machine learning and control. So I thought what I'll do for, for this talk, and it's going to be less than 30 minutes or so, and then we can have discussion after. But what I thought I'll do, I, I'll give a little bit, first of all, my perspective on where do I see like the big challenges that we, that we are facing when we combine machine learning and, and control and like what are maybe special challenges that are different from general machine learning. And then also uh, tell you a, a few, show you a few examples, uh, including some videos about kind of what, uh, what we've done and, and what can be done. All right. Um, so yeah, let me start just, just in general. So we, we, we all know, um, you know, these great success stories of using AI and machine learning. And obviously this is, for example, this is a decision problem. So in some sense it is close to control, but um, in another sense that I'll talk about, it's, it's also very different from what we talk about when we mean control of, of physical systems in particular. So this is, this is a success story of, of AI machine learning. There's many more uh, success stories of AI and machine learning. So here's one from my former home at, in Tübingen, where researchers have, uh, you know, trained deep networks to uh, imitate uh, uh, artists, so you can upload your favorite picture. This postcard image of Tübingen, and then you can choose the artist, and you get back maybe this image in the uh, Van Gogh style. So these are clearly fascinating examples of what we can do with um, with with machine learning and AI. But then there's other things that we that we can't do. So let me optimize here for video so hopefully you can see this video so uh, i guess you all know i mean these are kind of the type of things we would really like to be able to learn and do with with machines but we we can't really do them on the other hand humans can obviously learn and acquire these skills um so so that raises the question like where where uh, does uh, like why do we see this difference why do we on the one hand um have um you know, have um, fascinating success stories of AI and machine learning over here, like uh, beating the best human uh, in, in a complex game, like the game of Go. But on the other hand, we still don't have the robot in our households. And one very clear difference um, that we see here is that, that you know, the robot is, is interacting with the physical world. So we perceive the world and the robot acts in the world. Um, so this, the, the system really is in the physical world and has to, has to deal and has to, has to do something there. And that's very different from, from this, this one here, because here the system is really in an artificial world, not acting in the physical world. And this also kind of in, shows the intimate connection between um, you know, machine learning and control that we are facing when we want to put machine learning on the physical machines, because this is nothing, this is nothing but a control loop. Um, so, so clearly, you know, control dynamic systems are coupled here with, with the machine learning. And the big difference is that, that on the right side, we need to take, or we want to take action in, in the physical world, while on the left side, this is, this is really an artificial or a virtual world. And this now, if we want to do this, so basically we have, we have a number of challenges that, that we face when, when basically learning in the, in the real world. And um, from my perspective, these are, these are some of the really main or fundamental challenges. So one is basically the way we do, excuse me. There, there was a there was a, go ahead yeah it's okay fine all right um uh so the uh, um so so there, there's a there's a couple of challenges that we're really facing when we when we learn the, the physical world and one of this is really like how we do sampling so um on the you know the um in the artificial and virtual worlds we can essentially sample as much as we want we can try out arbitrary behavior uh, and and this way generate lots of data and learn from it and this is obviously not possible for our robot here because this one doing one wrong move could already mean the system is destroyed or even even worse someone gets get, getting injured so really the way we do sampling is much much more constrained we have to it's constrained by the physics and also it's it's more costly in general so we have to 
live with smaller sample sizes. And then often sort of the machines that we want to learn with, um, they are not there primarily or only for learning. They are there to do something else. Like a production machine is there to produce some parts or so. And in parallel, we would like to learn. And this brings about some interesting conflicts between, you know, what do we need to do to learn, like excite the system, for instance, versus what do we uh, want to achieve in terms of, um, you know, um, our normal operation of the system. And then often also, we've, we're not just facing just one problem, but if you think about multiple robots in a production plant or multiple cars or something, you have multiple systems that interact and all of them solving, solving learning problems. And then finally, um, um, uh, last not least, is that these systems are in the real world. So we want, we better have an idea of whether they work or not, also what their limitations are and kind of we'd like to be able to give guarantees. And these challenges that are listed here, in my opinion, are like some core fundamental challenges that we have when we combine machine learning with control and machine learning with the physical world that we don't necessarily have when we talk about machine learning only. Like, for instance, these, these aspects here, like robustness, stability, and so is something that we, um, that we always deal with in, in, in control, but that is not usually a concern if we just talk about standard machine learning. So, so these are challenges, fundamental challenges at the intersection of, of data science and, and engineering. Uh, or more, more specifically between machine learning and, uh, and control. Now, um, these challenges are also those that kind of that we're trying to deal with when we when in, in our work. So what I want to do now is kind of present you a few examples of what we have been um, working on and some of the things that we have been able to, to achieve um, as it may be a basis for, for uh, further discussion then. So one, problem that we that we're looking at a lot is kind of the question of how can we learn feedback controllers um, automatically from from data and in particular from small data because already mentioned like sampling on the physical platform is often involved so we want to be a very efficient sample efficient there and also be able to learn from small data um, and one one aspect or also one thing one 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 um, approach that in my opinion works very well and has worked very well in a couple of examples is if we combine you know our understanding of what are good controller architectures then with basically the database the um, the machine learning based um, approaches to optimize those so um, here's just basically a, a very standard pipeline where um, we have some sort of control design could be PID could be LQR what, what have you and this gives you an essentially like a controller architecture or controller that that however has has open parameters theta and these parameters critically determine like how well is your controller doing and then um, um, and, and they will critically determine how well you're doing on the on the physical system. And um, what very often in, in, in real life, what we do is we, we design a controller and then we put it on our hardware and then we try it out. And then this robot here, for instance, which is supposed to balance this, this pole, we're going to see, does it do the job or does it not? And then more often than not, we will find that, you know, the first design is not fine. And then we kind of look at what do we see in the experiment and, um, and try to update uh, our parameters by, by hand or manually. Now, um, this is of course very tedious and time consuming. So what we, are, we have been looking at and working with is to replace this basically with a database or machine learning based optimizer. And in particular, we've used Bayesian optimization, which, which essentially builds like a probabilistic surrogate model of this objective function of this J that you're trying to optimize. And this is obviously the function that you don't know because this captures basically the dependence of the parameters uh, or sorry, the dependence of the cost, like the performance that you care about on your, on your parameters. And this you do, don't know because you don't have a precise understanding of the physical hardware. But Bayesian optimization essentially builds a probabilistic model of that function. And then it uses this to sample in, in, in a clever or in, in, a, in, a, in, um, in a systematic way. So for instance, to maximize the information that you gain from an experiment. So um, let me show you how this how this works. Um, um, so here is is, an, uh, is a video of, of one of our robots. This robot is now supposed to uh, is learning to to balance the stick in its in its hand. And what you see here is the outcome actually of a previous learning run. So um, you see here that the robot is doing this fairly well. But what we do now is we replace the short stick with the long one. Obviously, the dynamics are changing, and if we run the previous controller. Um, the system uh, goes unstable very quickly, so the robot is not able to, to solve the task. 
Now, what we what we do is we run our uh, basically um, the, the Bayesian optimization approach on our controller architecture. And what you see here develop is this 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 probabilistic model that um, kind of gathers the knowledge uh, uh, from the experimental data. So each of the points here is one experiment that we run on on the, on the left. Um, and you see, and, and what we what we basically learn is this cost function, is the behavior between the parameters, this is the theta one and theta two to the cost. And we would like to achieve like a little small cost as possible to get, uh, which co corresponds to good balancing behavior. And what you notice here is that the system basically automatically or the method automatically focuses on those regions that are interesting, while regions of high cost only get sampled very sparsely. So here we're using this machine learning model, this machine learning approach to basically sample very efficiently. Okay. okay, could I pause you, Sebastian, now to take questions, just to make this interactive, right? If you just, I know you may not get through a lot of material, but I, I have natural questions. Yeah, I think can, everybody can, else does too. Can you go, go can you go back to the slide, the mathematics, the slide that showed the mathematics, please, Andreas, this is Andreas. Uh, yeah. Let's see, I didn't show too much mathematics, but maybe no, no, the is, is this the one or, or, or this one? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, okay. Yeah. I see. So do you... Do you run that on in real time? You can no. so, so the way we do this here, and also the way I, we have I, I show this in the video is basically you do one experiment, you gather the data, and uh, um, you update your model, and you then propose a new experiment. Often, what we then what you can do then in experiment is you kind of you do this in parallel. I mean, you get the data point, and you then already run the next experiment while you compute while you process your machine learning oh, model, and then the next data point. But okay. but this is. What, what I'm showing here is fundamental, it's, it's like an offline approach. Um, however, it's, uh, what is, what, it, 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 there's, there's also um, ideas of how you can do Bayesian optimization online, basically also adapting with, with what, the, what the system is doing. But here, what I showed in this video is really an offline approach. But can you show what J is on the next, this J plot in 3D, right? What, what are the coordinates of this J plot, this theta one? They're like the mass and the length or something of the model? Ah, uh, no, actually, so you mean here? Yeah, what are the axes? Yeah, there? so in, in this, in, so uh, may, maybe I it's actually, let me, let me go back then. Um, so the, um, I think we can best explain this here. Yes. So, so yeah, the theta really is are the parameters of the controller architecture. So that, that's what I was what I said that basically um, what would this like a proportional be, gain and derivative gain for instance for instance in this in this specific case what I showed in the video it's it's actually uh, the weight matrix or entries of the weight matrices of the of the uh, LQR of the optimal controller so okay. there's a cost there's yet another cost function that we use to design the controller and this one has parameters that we would typically tune and tweak by hand and these ones are the ones that we now tune with Bayesian optimization. It and then like you, you sample. Had two Go ahead. There. Looks like you only had two dimensions. So, uh, can you explain yeah, the relationship? With the... Right. Yeah. So, so in the exactly. So, in in this video, um, let me I, I turn off the video optimization and can see you. Um, so, in this video, um, this was indeed this was just two parameters of these. But um, um, it, it, uh, you can also you can also do more. Um, so you typically often reach a limit, like when it comes to ten or so. Then then with these type of techniques, <laughs> it gets more tricky. But uh, but um, basically, we there had two just for the sake of having a nice plot. But for the for the, the APR problem, there really has something like four or five parameters that we would be tuning in. How about a thousand parameters? Yeah, not with those methods. Not with those methods. So no. okay, are you want to talk about that? Uh, I'm, uh, I, I, I'm going to show uh, an example where we have uh, where we run a deep neural network as a controller, which in some sense has like that many parameters. But it's not it's not this tuning problem. This is so here okay. the philosophy is very different. Here the philosophy is very different from you know the deep learning type philosophy. Here the philosophy is okay. We often know what what a good controller architecture is. And in this case, for the balancing, it might be the LQR. In other case, it might be PID. We've also been tuning like observer-based structures where you have like some surrogate model that you use as an observer and then you put a controller on top. But still there, you have some parameters, parameters of the model, of the plant model or, and or of the controller. And you can also tune these. So here the philosophy really is, let's use a well-established and well-understood control architecture that leaves you with only like one or two handful of parameters. And then let's tune these parameters with, um, in this case, Bayesian optimization in a systematic way. What do I mean by tuning in a systematic way? Systematic 
here in what I showed means information efficiency. So we sample where we believe to learn most about the system or most about the controller. I'm going to show and just right after this also how we can then combine this with, with the other data sources. But um, here's information efficiency. There's other approaches using similar techniques that also go would go for safety, where essentially you only sample where you already are relatively certain um, so that you don't sample where there's lots of uncertainty. And this could also be, you know, could you illustrate by means of this 3D plot how the Bayes principle is working again? Is it is it really automatic or you you don't choose those points, right? The algorithm chooses on the next video, this nice yeah. video, you, you no, not that one, the one that, yeah, that one, okay. In what so, way is it sampling those points? Yeah, so I, I yeah, so J, J is now, is that's the cost and now, and now the cost is of two parameters, uh, J of theta, uh, J of theta one and theta two. Now, um, what you see here, this is basically the, the Gaussian process. More specifically, it's the mean. So the, 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 the purple, the purple surface is the, is the mean. This is kind of the expectation of how, we, how the algorithm thinks the functions look, looks like. And then you have the uncertainty, like these gray, grayish areas, these are the uncertainty areas. And um, what this algorithm now does, it takes this probabilistic model and computes an information gain. Essentially, it asks, okay, if I'm going to sample anywhere in the theta space, what is the information that I'm going to that I'm going to gain? And an approximation, or like a simpler way of doing this, would be, can I um, to sample where the uncertainty is the is the largest? But here we have a combination of it's not just the uncertainty; uncertainty plays into this, but then it's also um, that the algorithm knows that we want to optimize. So, for instance, if I if I have a, if I have a value that is already relatively high, then this is not not as in, not very interesting for the algorithm because it's very unlikely that the that the minimum is going to be there. While if you are somewhere that already has like a low mean, then this this gives you an incentive to sample there because the chances are higher that you find a good optimum. So okay. maybe I run the run this run this again. So what you see here is that. You sample in areas that, that tend to have kind of low function values, while those areas that give high values. So here, for instance, like maybe I can pause here again. So this area here has relatively high function values, and, and we have only sampled very sparsely here. So we have we have a few samples so that we see, okay, this is going up, and then we know, okay, this area is not interesting anymore. So we don't sample any further there. While this area over here tends to have small low values, so we 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 sample more over over here, um, and this is what the algorithm gives you. So the algorithm automatically trades off this kind of we want to go where there's uncertainty, but also where there's where there's a good chance of finding a better optimum. Any other questions? Yes, but here uh, you do not take advent any advantage that uh, it was before able to uh, stabilize. For a shorter poll, yes, it actually doesn't mat matter for this that, example. That, that's correct. For what, what I'm what I'm showing here, it basically starts from scratch. It 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 it, it starts from scratch. But but what is also would also make a lot of sense here is to use. So it depends a bit. Like if you if you have that information available, and in this case we could measure like the let's say the the length of the poll or so, we could use this as a context variable, like an additional external variable in our our model. Um, that 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 we can use to basically um, correlate our model with the let's say the length of the poll, and then next time let's say we have a poll that is similar to one that we've already seen, we could leverage that information. But we're not doing this here. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Sounds good. Then um, let me move on. Um, actually. So this this connects right right to what we what we talked about before, because now the, the core really of this approach is this probabilistic model. And what I've showed you and what we've discussed now is how can I use this probabilistic model to um, you know decide where I want to sample next, where I want to get more information. But we can also use this probabilistic model to now fuse information. And one typical thing that you will have in 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 uh, uh, you know in control or robotics or, or whatever is that you you have the experiment, but you also have a simulator. And then um, the simulator um, gives you um, does give you information, but it's less informative in the sense that it's only an approximation of the of the truth. But it's often faster, so you can more you can you can sample fast. You can you can run more experiments faster. So then the trade off or the question is, do I rather do kind of many less informative uh, experiments, or do I do a few you know 
more expensive, uh, is, is, uh, more expensive um, um, uh, experiments that give me more information. So do I do many simulations or do I do um, you know, physical experiments? And um, what is now nice about this probabilistic model is that it, this can also be used now to try to trade this off because essentially you need to model like how much information do you get from each of these sources. And then the model can ask not only where do I want to sample, but also do I want to do a sample in simulation or in the experiment? Um, and then I can compare basically the information gain that I get per unit of cost. And the unit of cost could be, for instance, the time that it takes to run such an, such an experiment. Um, so, so uh, and on, on a high level, this is this is what we're essentially doing now. The Bayesian optimizer not only says what parameters are we are we trying to uh, do we want to try, but also do I want to try this this parameter in simulation or in in uh, in, in reality? Um, so uh, let me show you how this looks like on a again on a video. Um, so this is a simpler system here. So this is just a card pole, and we have like a, an experiment, an experiment card pole, and and a simulator. And here the simulation is just a linear one, so it's really fast. And now um, we essentially run our algorithm as before. Um, let me pause this here for a second and then explain. So again, we have like two parameters. We have parameter one, parameter two. These are just two two parameters, so similar to the ones before. And now we have a cost the cost function here, also similar to uh, as before. But now we have we have two options of doing experiments. One is um, to to run a simulation. This is going to be a blue dot, uh, or in red to do a physical experiment. And what we now see here as this evolves is that we the algorithm decides first to do simulations, um, and then here it, it did one experiment and it noticed oh you know the, actually the cost values are actually higher than what I thought. So it, then it leaves this area. And then it continues with simulations and um, and so on and so forth. And later on, it does a few more physical experiments. But and why did it choose that? Why did it choose that red point way to the right? Was that just a random choice? Is it stochastic, right? Yeah, yeah, it's it's a, it's a it's a good that's a good question. So I can't really pinpoint to okay, this exactly is the reason why we chose this point. What we optimize here is the information gain. And we compare the information gain from a simulation and from an experiment. So there's many things that, that go into this. Um, in addition, there's also a random component uh, in, in, in there. But in principle, you know what this algorithm does, it, it compares the information gain that we get from the two. And then here, it apparently decided to do one experiment there. Uh, could have also been random here, this one, I don't know. But, but then what we do see is that because we go up high here with, with our cost, this area gets uh, is, is not very interesting. And we don't do any, any further samples here. While this area here, we, we end up doing more uh, physical experiments um, or uh, samples because there, this is also, I think, the area where we in the end find the optimal controller. Can I ask a question of clarification? Um, yeah. Just so I understand. The cost here is basically the control performance. In other words, how stable is the pole and how, exactly. how much effort? It's some measure that you've made up to measure how good it's performing, exactly. right? Exactly. In the experiment. So it's something that you measure by doing a control and measuring numerically what this cost is. So, is so it's, it, yeah, it's, I mean, specifically, it's, it's a classical quadratic cost that combines uh, a, a quadratic weights on the states and, and, the, and the inputs you. Yeah, but you um, measure it numerically by doing the experiment, either in simulation exactly. or reality. Exactly. Okay. Okay. But then in order to evaluate this Bayesian expression, you would need to have the uh, explicit controller, right? This, this wouldn't be appropriate for MPC or something, would it? It would be appropriate when you can evaluate this quadratic cost. Uh, no, uh, no, the, the cost you can evaluate anytime, right? Exactly. I mean, it would be it, actually, so we, we, I'm not showing any experiments of this, and, uh, but, but there's other groups that, that use Bayesian optimization for MPC. That's actually fine. So it doesn't really matter because um, as long as you can run your controller, um, either in simulation or in the experiment, um, then you're good, right? Because then you get the data. But don't you need the marginals, like the derivatives, in order to evaluate these base formulas? No. Or you no, need actually, okay. so this is this is really just on. I mean, we built we so we built a surrogate model. Um, um, this is this is then a, a Gaussian process that we use to do all the processing basically. But we don't need okay. we don't need a derivative or anything from a controller. Um, so what what we okay. really the sampling is just just yeah just zero orders. But you need zero okay. order samples. You you evaluate your, you run your experiment and that gives you a data point. Thank you. Any other question? Okay. Go ahead.
then let me um, I, I continue this video. So um, so so after yeah, just basically just the result of that tuning. In the end, we have this uh, you know the learned controller, and in this case, you know we could we could save uh, quite a few um, real experiments. Rock solid. Yeah. Um, so here here's here's another. Uh, oh, sorry. So for Cardpol, it was still LQR, tuning LQR, or was it something more complex? Um, is, is, can you, sorry, can you say the question again? Yes, but for L, uh, the, the controller you were tuning for LQR, it was just, uh, like for Cardpol, it was LQR, or it was something else? No, this, yeah, this was LQR. Yeah, this was again LQR, it's similar to the, to the previous one. Um, but here now combining the simulation with the real experiments. Okay. So um, here, here's another variant of, of that kind of that way of doing tuning, um, which is uh, where we also want to in include, um, you know, failures in, in our experiments um, or that we may have in our experiments. So let me, let me show you or run this video and to motivate this a little bit. So what we have here is this is this quadruped robot, and we want to learn actually to, this robot to jump as high as possible. And uh, jumping higher requires kind of more current, obviously. But then when the current goes too large, then the motors shut off, and then you get failure. You know, how it could look like? You know, you have you know the motors shut off in midair, and then the the robot falls over. Um, so so what we are looking at here is that basically we want to. Um, I'll pause this here for a second. We want to max, we have a cost function. In this case, it's not the quadratic cost, it's more direct. It's kind of, we want to maximize the height. We want to, this robot to jump up as high as possible, but we now have a constraint. And the constraint is that the current cannot be too high. However, what is too high, we don't really know because this, this depends very much on the, on, the, on the physical representation of that robot. It might also depend on the, on the specific controller that we, that we, that we use. Simply, what, what we know is that at some point the, mo ro the, the motors will shut up, shut off if the if the current uh, uh, ends up being too high. But the the direct the you know the connection between our controller parameters and then the question like when is the current too high? This is what we don't know. So what we have, or way we model this, is that we say we have a constraint that depends on our parameters, the controller parameters, but we don't know what the th threshold is. And now what what we are doing is we want to kind of do two things. We want to learn you know, optimize the height while also, um, you know, learning the, the threshold on the side. Plus when we do, when we happen to have a failure, because that could obviously happen if we don't know the constraints a priori, we cannot, you know, put it into our optimization. So we might end up having a failure. Um, and then we want to, we want to use the information of, from, from that failure. And, um, um, and this, this information from the failure is then basically it's it's a it's in, in a sense it's it's hybrid type of information because if you you run an experiment you run an experiment and you can measure the height and then you know okay I can give a number I can give a number of how 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 how, how well I've done. However, if I have a failure, then it just means okay I failed. I can't really give like a number. What what, what does it mean? Does it mean I didn't jump at all, or should I give a penalty, or what should I do? So I really have this 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 hybrid information that if I'm successful, I can assign a number to how successful I was. Well, if I fail, all I know is I failed. So I did worse than anything else that, uh, that, than, than, uh, than, than, I, that I've seen. And this is what we now kind of, we're doing two things here in this work is we're learning this threshold and we are um, kind of, we have an, 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 uh, a modified model, a modified probabilistic model that allows us to include this hybrid information. Um, so maybe I just just run the, run the video um, to to show what what now happens. Um, so as I said, basically what we want to do there's two things: we want to include this hybrid information from failure or success, and we want to learn this threshold. So let's now have a have a look at this robot. So um, here's now a typical run. So we we start in, with an in initial parameterization. It's doing okay. It's not really jumping very high. It's it's poor performance, but but it, you know it doesn't fail. And then we keep going again. The, the objective is to maximize the information. So we kind of quite quickly get to reasonable heights. But then as we keep going, also it's a random exploration process to some extent, we, we happen to have a failure. Right here. This was a failure. But then we can now incorporate this information from our failure, one, to know that okay, here we didn't get a good performance, but also to get an idea of what, what, the, what the threshold is like. And then we keep going. Uh, and uh, yeah, combining either success or failure. 
and uh, and in the end um, basically arrive at a at a, at a good controller. Um, so I think we stop here after 50 iterations, and then we can compare like what we what we've achieved. So on the left is the initial one. The middle is like what we tuned by hand. Then or no, sorry, these are all the kind of the, the best controllers. It's the comparison of three of the runs. Um, and now we do the performance comparison. Like on the left is the initial one. The middle is kind of manual tuning, and, and then the Bayesian optimization framework in here uh, achieved the, the the best high. So, we, so we, can I ask you a question of clarification here? Is it yep, doing please. control during the jumping and during the landing to try to stabilize its landing? No. Uh, well, okay. So then, yeah, that's a good question. So we don't we don't stabilize the flight or the landing. Let's say. So what we what what we what we have here is we have controllers in those legs that basically um, um, you know control like the, the movement of the legs and those controllers have some parameters and these parameters we are we are tuning so we're not we're not specifically controlling let's say the flight or the, the landing phase okay so, so you just want to jump as high when it lands it's done by some torque control or something like that that happens to to absorb the force you don't yeah, concern well, with the landing exactly, at all exactly yeah yeah exactly okay, okay. Okay, good. So um, yeah, that's actually the, the the first kind of set of methods that I that I wanted to talk about. I was talking about like which is kind of Bayesian optimization for controller tuning. Because the question was also for this talk, like what what methods work like from experience, like what methods work well, and and and, and you know. And I would say this, these are things that can that can work quite uh, um, you know successfully. That if you have like a good controller structure, but then you want to you know, offload the tuning of the parameters to a machine learning method. And then this machine learning method you can do to, to do different types of tuning. You can go for information efficiency. You can incorporate information from different sources. You can also do safe tuning, which is something that I haven't shown here, but you could also use, use that. So these, these things are, you know, I would say often work quite well. And we've run this on several systems also with industry partners and so on. So this is, this is uh, something that in my opinion works, works very well. Um, I uh, want to talk, show you a little bit like a, like a slightly different perspective on, on in, in some sense, the same problem. Um, where, um, where, we, uh, um, where, we, where we want to basically also find a good controller, but in, as we do this, we learn a dynamics model on, on the side. And this actually often allows us to be even more sample efficient. So let me let me explain what we what we do here. So the, the base question is the same. You have a you want to learn a controller um, from from data um, by interacting with the physical system. Now instead of directly you know observing the performance on the on the platform and then tuning the controllers, we we take a step in between here. We we use the data, the input output data of the physical plant, um, and to to build a, a dynamical system model. And um, here we again work with a probabilistic model. So it's going to be again a Gaussian process. Um, which we, we then use basically for uh, optimization. So we then optimize our controller parameters in a sense in an offline optimization procedure. And then once we have a new controller, we go out and do another experiment. Um, now, this is, this is the core framework of model-based reinforcement learning. Why model-based? Not because you have a model in the first place, but because you learn a model in the side, on the side. Um, and, and why is this good? So, um, it, if you manage to do this, if you get a good probabilistic system model here, then, um, then in a sense you are done because you no longer, longer need to sample your physical uh, system um, um, because then you can do your optimization based on the model. But then the critical bit, of course, is how, to, how do you get this, uh, this probabilistic model in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a nice way or in a reliable way. And this is, I'm not gonna go, I don't have time to go into the details here, but this is where, we, where we've done some contributions in this work, not the model-based reinforcement learning framework itself. There we use the existing method, but we, we've improved basically the way that these models are being learned such that you get reliable um, um, probabilistic models of, of these. Um, and just to compare to what we've done before, so we, have this, we have the same task here. This robot is supposed to, and let me optimize video clip quality again, and then I restart this. Um, so this robot here is again to learn this uh, balancing this, this stick. Now it starts without anything. It doesn't even have, I mean, there is a PID controller, but it doesn't start with one that is kind of okay with balancing. What we start here with, we, we just some, apply some random action. And from this random action, 
um, in the first iteration, the robot gets a first rough model, then it uses this rough model to opt update it con its controller, and then it does another experiment. So you see here, after four iterations, it almost got it, but not quite. And then after five iterations, it finally managed uh, to, to balance this, this poll. And the interaction time with the system here is less than 20 seconds, which was which is way less than what we had to do with the, with the Bayesian optimization approach. Because here we could use the data to train a dynamics model, um, which we then use for the, for, the, for the optimization. And if this works, if the model converges, then um, you, are, you are typically more, more sample efficient. But of course, the critical bit is to get the, the, to, to, to get the model training to work. And this is, this is what, we, what we've done in this work, is that we basically um, we proposed a new way of training um, these Gaussian process models. So we call this multi-step Gaussian process, MSGP, because it optimizes for long, long term, a more long-term ahead prediction, which is obviously critical when you tune the controllers. And then what we obtained in these experiments is that basically um, um, with the, the, the standard approach, which would be the green one here, um, in our in this example would, would not converge. So this is this is the loss um, over learning iterations. So one learning iteration means a new model and a new controller. And if we use the standard approach, um, the green one would never converge. It doesn't find a con controller that, that would balance uh, our, our task here. Um, while with this other way of training the model, um, we were able to converge very reliably. So I think these are five learning runs and each time we, we converge after seven or eight iterations. And this shows that quite obviously in the model-based you know, reinforcement learning approach, the critical bit is to learn a, a good model. And then if you manage to do this, then, then you can be more sample efficient. Yeah. It looks really um, practical. It looks quite practical. I mean, I, I'm curious if there are questions here. I think that people don't have much expertise here in Gaussian process modeling. At least I certainly don't. Maybe some people, you know, we heard the talk, uh, one of the first talks we had from Ugo Rosolia does heavy duty Gaussian process modeling for, uh, you know, call, uh, driving. Mm -hmm. And he very successfully showed that he could do use Gaussian process modeling to quickly learn with a couple of circuits of the track how to drive a, a car at the, at the traction limits a physical car, like an automotive car, the traction limits, yeah, like this. I guess you've also done similar work, right? So, so, so this is this is obviously not a real car. It's a model. It's a model car, um, but but this does also, you know, it runs part of a track uh, with a with a, with the Gaussian process dynamics model, um, and then we use this to optimize a controller. So we did this in uh, I think twenty seventeen or so together with Bosch, and and yep. uh, this worked quite successfully that you use this this you know GP dynamics model. To get a good understanding of what what the what the car does, and then and then in particular in situations like going going around a curve or something where you want to reach the dynamics limits, and then you can use this to to further optimize your controller. And and this and if you just pause this lovely video here, this is also very convincing. If you pause this video, this looks a lot like the rollouts that we're doing in our topic area. Um, I don't know if Flo is there or, or anybody working on the L two race. These are rollouts, right, of the of the Gaussian process model. Yes, yes. From a particular point? Yeah, so, so the Gaussian process model basically captures, um, you know, from one state to the next state. Um, and then you can unroll this. And this is what, what gives you those trajectories here. So I, let me I run this again. So in the beginning, um, so here you, you see, you know, there's, there's also these uncertainty um, yeah. uncertainty uh, uh, funnels here around. Um, and, and as you gather more data, this the uncertainty is basically reduced. So if I run this, you know, these these uncertainty uh, areas shrink. And this is unrolling the GP model and it gives you basically, you know, part of that trajectory. It really seems quite practical. I mean, what is the problem with these Gaussian process models besides the fact that they are assuming Gaussian noise or Gaussian uh, uncertainty, right? If, well, if you have well, a bi well, yeah. bimodal, it doesn't work, right? If, if, for example, in some situation, you might have a bimodal distribution of uncertainty. Yeah. Yeah. So first of all, the yeah, in, in, exactly. So first of all, the the the, the Gaussian process itself is just a non-nonlinear function approximator. So you can you can in a sense approximate any nonlinear function. That function, however, would be the dynamics function. So it would be state at x, x the state at time t to the state at time t plus one. And and then if when you unroll this, you typically also make a Gaussian approximation in between, like you. Like obviously, if you start with the Gaussian, you push this through a nonlinear function, then you won't have a Gaussian. Um, so if you want to keep this tractable, then what what this method does and what these plots show is that you indeed is that, that you then approximate 
after each step with the with the Gaussian again. And and this, of course, as you said, you know, it, this won't work if you have a multimodal distribution for your state, for instance. Also, um, Gaussian processes tend to, uh, you know, they're computationally um, somewhat expensive, or they 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 have a problem when it comes to like really huge data data sets, like large data size, a big data size. Well, that opens up the question. I mean, is it is it something that us hardware de developers could think about accelerating? Since Gaussian process modeling is so useful and so data I efficient, so. I yeah, because we're Monte Carlo, microchain Monte Carlo. Can, sorry, I didn't. I didn't acoustically understand here. Marcos chain Monte Carlo. Yeah, I mean, if you can do it in real time and fast enough, then you're in good business. So I understood Markov chain Monte Carlo, but what? what yeah, what I mean, I think to accelerate stochastic processing of this sort, you know, what do you need to have? I mean, at the limit. Yeah, well, I mean, um, so 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 one one aspect. I mean, if you for, want to solve the full full inference, basically this this scales poorly with the with the number of data points. Yes. So one 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 aspect that 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 uh, one aspect to approach this is that you that you know you use sparse approximations where you approximate basically the full data set with the representative number of of of, of data points, and this way you can. Uh, you know, get get around of also being able to handle larger data sets uh, because you replace with a smaller number of representative representative points. This is one way, way how to approach it. Um, but yeah, it depends what you want to do, I guess. Just, re just relating to um, being unimodal, um, in the plot we see so multiple different trajectories. Um, what, what does that mean with respect to the Gaussian process? The, the, the plot that you that, that I'm showing here in this in that this, one yeah so you get these different scenarios but some uh, intuitively I would expect the Gaussian process here to have a, sim, a single mode so what creates these different um, good, good, good I think those question. are different yeah. control inputs and the predictions now it's, right? it's, these it's, are different it's, measurements yeah. and yeah, predictions it's, it's, yeah in a sense so it's different parts of the track actually of the racetrack so it's, it's different part of the racetrack but it's it's using it's basically predictions with the same Gaussian process model but we I mean it's just Different parts of the racetrack plotted put in one plot so that we can see it all, all together. Oh, I see. Oh, but, but, but it's okay, basically okay. just different parts of that overall racetrack because in the end you want to be able to predict all parts of the racetrack well. Thank you. Um, one thing I'm interested in, uh, since you worked a lot with Gaussian processes, um, how difficult do you find it to tune the kernel functions, or how do you how do you fit those? Uh, I mean, they're not fitted, right? They're tuned. Um, so how difficult is it to do that for realistic systems? So it, it depends. So we, it, it, so you're saying they're not fitted, they're tuned. I think you do, you can do both. I mean, it depends. Um, so, so also often basically the, the parameters, the hyperparameters of the Gaussian process are uh, optimized from data um, um, using hyperparameters, some, some form of hyperparameter optimization, but you can also tune them. It, it depends. It, I would say primarily depends on the data regime. If we are in really low data regimes, not, not so much this one that I showed here, but with the Bayesian optimization before, we really in the end have just like 10, 20 samples. You know, you cannot expect that from that few samples, you can actually optimize also the hyperparameters from data. That's that's a, not a well-posed problem. Um, so there often we, so what there's different things you can do. One thing is that, um, yes, you tune it by hand. You might know something. I mean, often, you know, uh, operators of controller will, will know, okay, the, the parameters are in a specific range and then they, you know the, like roughly how they change. This is one thing you could do. You could also think about, you know, using the data from previous um, trials. Like obviously you don't want to rely specifically on the data of a, of a previous tuning, tuning run, but you can use this data to basically obtain um, hyper priors. So this would be, prior distributions for your hyperparameters. Mm -hmm. And if you and, and these you could then use to basically in, start your the specific tuning experiment from an informed state that you know, okay, roughly from previous tuning runs, this is what I can expect. These are length scales or, or you know orders of magnitude for my for my controller. Um, and then you give this as prior information to the um, to the to the to the Gaussian process. This is something that you can you can also do if you have lots yeah. of data. And I believe in this application we just we just did standard hyperparameter optimization where you basically also optimize the parameters of the kernel uh, from um, from from data. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, I guess it's something you have to just take into account, right? It's it's maybe a disadvantage of that method. Um, but I guess if you have working strategies to counter it, it it's it's okay. Because I would have another question going from there. Um, 
I mean, do you think that any model kind that's not uncertainty aware has any uh, justification in this kind of application scenario? Because you heavily rely on this being able to quantify the uncertainty of predictions, right? Do you think they, there is any justification to say, yeah, we can take a model that does not have any measurement of uncertainty of its predictions? Uh, okay, so there's, there's a couple of things. First, first you said basically it's a disadvantage that we have those hyperparameters. Well, I would say, you know, you have them in any machine learning model, you have some hyperparameters. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, it depends, in, in, it depends on the application whether the hyperparameters are more easy or not to, to tune, let's say, or to obtain. Um, but I wouldn't say it's specifically a disadvantage of Gaussian processes because you will have other hyperparameters and other machine learning methods uh, often or usually. Now, is any is a method that does not capture uncertainty justified or not? Um, well, I mean, it, it depends, right? I mean, if you if if you need to have if you want or need to have the uncertainty in, represented in your model, then then you need an uncertainty model. But but um, if it's like here, we use the uncertainty to basically um, uh, to to here here we use the uncertainty to get an to get an idea of how um, uh, of, of how precise are we in certain parts of the of the of the racetrack and now this uncertainty and I'm, I haven't shown this but in other words we use this uncertainty for example to have in, to choose informed samples to then decide oh now we need to we need to have more data in this area because we have larger uncertainty there and if you if you don't have that then there would be no way that you can do this in, informed sampling let's say but if you if it's just about the tuning of the nominal state let's say and you don't care about safety or anything i think it's also obviously fine to use methods that don't um, don't have this uncertainty or you put other safety mechanisms around. Like, um, I don't know if we still have time, but I could show another video where we use a deep, deep new Please network. show one more video. One more video, yeah. <laughs> you love it. <laughs> to, approx to approximate a, a model predictive controller, actually. And there we have like some basically validation procedure around. And the, the, the new deep neural network doesn't have any uncertainty in there, but we have a validation that we put around. So do we, do we yeah, have five minutes? And I can still show sure. that. Okay, sounds good. Then... Um, um, so, so in, in what kind of what we are looking at here is in a, in a sense, a different way to combine machine learning and, and, and control. Like in this case, we assume we have a model predictive controller we start with, um, and this one we want to want to approximate. Um, so why would you do this? First of all, well, the way you, why you would want to do is that because MPC, because it has an online optimization in each time. You don't need to tell us. We know why. Yeah. Just yeah. go ahead. Yeah. I will, and and therefore what we do here is that we that we that we basically use the MPC to generate samples. So we have an MPC, but we run it offline to generate samples, and then we train a neural network with this. And if you do this, um, that's obviously not new. People have done that before. But what did, what happens if you do that just in a naive way? You lose the guarantees. Like the MPC comes with nice guarantees, but if you just approximate with the neural network, then you know you you don't have these guarantees anymore. So one, and this is what we are looking at here. So, so what we are trying to do here, or what we're doing is that we, that we combine now a robust design on the control side that includes additional you know, uncertainty. And then we combine this with statistical validation on the machine learning side. So more specifically, what do we do? We assume that we have some additional dis hypothetical disturbance on our input. Um, and then we design the controller such that it is robust, so it's stable, no matter what this input is or this, this disturbance is, as long as it's bounded. And then we use this to train our neural network. Um, and afterwards, we run a statistical validation. So we run many, many samples and check what is the difference between the output of the neural network and the output of the MPC. And if, you know, for many, many samples, the difference between is less than this D max. Um, so we can say we can validate with high probability that this property holds. Then, because we have the robustness property over here, we can we can basically obtain or we we keep the, retain the the guarantees of the new of the model predictive controller also for the neural network because we know that these guarantees will also hold even if we are we have a little uncertainty and we have shown with high probability that the uncertainty is actually within those bounds. So then you have the advantages of the neural network controller plus also the guarantees. However, in a, in, a, in a statistical sense, and this is what I, what I meant. Now, the neural network of itself is just a deterministic model, but we have these guarantees um, through the validation procedure yeah. around it. What can it do? So, pardon me, what did you say? Go ahead, yeah. go ahead. I, I was, uh, um, so what, um, 
what we see here in this video is now the uh, robot that is supposed to basically uh, reach to where we point with the stick. And on the left, you see just this, the robust model predictive controller. It's nonlinear ro robust model predictive control. And you see it's doing the job. You can also move around obstacles, but it is fairly slow. Um, and then on the on the right, we have basically the same controller, but now approximated with the, with the deep neural network. And you can hopefully see that basically the arm reacts much, much faster than, than on the left side. So on the left side, the arm is still, you know, reacting relatively slow. Here it's it's much faster on the right. So we're roughly 20 times faster than with the with the nonlinear MPC on the uh, on, on the left. Um, now you also probably notice that we don't move any obstacles through the scene here because we really reach the limit of what we could, you know. Uh, uh, sample with the statistical validation technique. This is at the moment the limitation mm. that if you we go to higher uh, problems or like higher dimensional problems, you need you need um, basically way too many samples. But I should say that the way we do the statistical validation is also quite naive, and there's there are several ways that we think we can improve it. Um, but this is kind of work in progress. But what this does show is that you know you can now run this deep neural network as a controller. It's much faster than the MPC. And we, um, we we have guarantees at least for like reasonable or smaller sized problems. What's the structure of that neural network control? Is it an MLP that masks basically from? Uh, how does it? How... So this this is actually just just a relatively standard um, um, feed forward neural networks. Feed forward neural network. It's I think it's primarily mm -hmm. using ReLU activations because it's sim it's really just a, a classical you know supervised learning problem that we're solving here. We have just some input states and, and what we get is the control inputs. And this is just what we are, what we are mapping. So there's so, nothing, nothing fancy it's in terms of the architecture. Yeah, no, but it's able to control all the degrees of freedom and do the feedback control, right, for stability, stable control, yes, it, right? So it, it, yes, it does the feedback control, yeah. But, but, but if you think about it, I mean, the MPC, the, the MPC at the end of the day is, is just, it's, it's a map from you have a state and this state gives you an input. So it's a map from X to U. So it's just this, and if you have, have many samples of these, it's just a supervised learning problem. Now, what, 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 you, what you're saying is makes a lot of sense. So this is another direction we want to extend this because often in, in MPC, we know there's areas where, for instance, you have, you know, you clip your inputs, right? I mean, you're operating at the, at the limitation of your inputs. So this is like, these type of things would make sense to somehow incorporate in the neural network architecture so that you don't have to learn that from scratch. So um, I have a I have a comment on which is really you you address now the computational complexity. I mean, how many the problem is still a cubic uh, complexity. It has cubic computational complexity because that's really what you have in a Gaussian when you are using Gaussian processes to do. This is not Gaussian process model, no, though, right? This is not Gaussian process. Yeah. So how many? I mean, again, how many? What's the limit of doing this in real time? with how many parameters? I think that's a question that Toby was trying to ask earlier. No, no, it's not. I was just asking about this particular um, neural network control, which we're trying to avoid, right? Because we realize that nobody will uh, accept a publication with a neural network controller unless you can make some kind of safety guarantee, right? Is that true, Sebastian, in your experience, just for this community? In the control depends, community, it depends, it's depends on the community. I mean, there's lots of lots of controllers, neural network controllers that are proposed in deep reinforcement learning and that are used that don't don't have a safety guarantee. Um, whether this is good, I, I, I think is questionable. Um, I think it's 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 I think it's good to push on both ends. I mean, you want to push on the performance side. You want to show what is possible with 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 neural networks, with deep neural networks, even if you don't in the first place have a guarantee. Obviously you can only use this for a very limited number of applications then, but uh, and, and at the same time you wanna push like, how can we reach safety guarantees, right? And here we are more on kind of, how, this is an approach of how, where, how we can get some safety guarantees for the deep neural network control. Um, and just to emphasize, so this is not a Gaussian process, this is a neural network, um, at, but, but the limitation really here is the, is, you know, the number of samples that we need for the statistical validation to get reasonable, um, you know, uh, 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 safety guarantees here. But I, I think, I mean, there's definitely, I mean, if in, in, in deep reinforcement learning community, I mean, what people do is they train neural networks, deep neural networks for control tasks, for robot manipulation tasks or other tasks. And, and there's not that every, each of these uh, has, a, has a theoretical guarantee. Thank you. Okay, so Sorry, but we're out of time. I want to give you a great big thanks and also for being so patient with the typical Telluride technique of interrupting you and derailing oh, your perfect. presentation at the very beginning.
No, no, this is this is this is perfect. I, yeah. appreciate, that. I appreciate the discussion. Thank you. The talk should be driven by the audience or more of the audience than me, right? Basically, you get pushed around, right? To, so your talk is totally different than what you thought it would be. Yeah. This so is anyway, thank fun. you so very much. It's really appreciated. And we would appreciate also your advice within the topic area in, ter in terms of practical experiments that we could carry out as in projects. If you're willing to join us uh, an hour from now, sure, we'd really yeah, so appreciate it. So sounds good. Yeah, thank thanks a lot for, for having me. My, my, my pleasure. Thank you. Okay, um, in that case, I'll stop the recording now because I think we now have just a topic area meeting. Is that true, uh, Emre?